Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. And guys, I'm Gavin Shaw. Alex Wolf has the day off. So I am joined by my best friend from across the pond, the legend, Jack Huntley, a fantastic, I, I would go so far as to say elite writer for the Strickland. And he came out with, well, has come out with one article recently, is about to come out with another, both of which are really, really good. The first one is all about the Knicks defense. So we do a deep dive on why the Knicks have struggled on that end of the floor this year, including issues in transition, issues with fouling, the adjustments of the new guards, Kemba Walker and Evan Fournier, Julius Randle having somewhat, uh, or at least inconsistent moments on that end, Mitchell Robinson still finding his form, and so much more about the defense. And then Jack wrote a big piece about Obi Toppin. So we dive deep on how he's improved this year, where he still needs to get better, and what his future ultimately is on the New York Knicks. So all that and more right now on Locked on Knicks. You are Locked on Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, and we wanted to thank you, as always, for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day. I'm Gavin Shaw, a play-by-play broadcaster back to work. Alex Wolf has the day off. So today, I am joined by Jack Huntley from across the pond. He writes about the Knicks at the Strickland. And Jack, I've said it before. I will say it again now. You're not just one of my favorite Knicks writers. You're just one of my favorite writers period. Uh, really, really enjoy all your work. And lucky me, I, I, we have not one, but two articles to talk about today. Uh, you you <laughs> released a fantastic piece uh, breaking down the Knicks issues defensively a couple of days ago. And uh, I was lucky to find out because I have an insider source at the Strickland. You have a piece coming out on Obi Toppin uh, pretty soon. I got to read it ahead of time. It was fantastic. So long-winded way of saying, Jack, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you very much. Um yeah, good to be here. We'll give Alex a day off, I suppose, once in a while. Yeah, he worked, the guy The guy works really hard. He's doing, doing a lot of editing. He, has to, he wears he has to, many hats. He has to interpret your strange English vernacular and oh, and, and, and translate it for, for an American audience. He probably has to change like 20 spellings every yeah. time I submit something. So I just cannot remember um, yeah. to do it, to do it by instinct. Maybe I'm not, I, mean, I might not be speaking for the full audience, but I, I find it charming. I, I like, I like the English. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's, that's cool. I, I didn't know you could spell it like that. That's fun. We'll um, go with that. We'll go with all right, that. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Uh, let's, let's get into it. All right, all right. Talking the Knicks defense. So the, since you wrote the article, which again was just five days ago, the Knicks uh, defensive numbers have actually gotten worse. They were 20th in the league in defense, according to Cleaning the Glass um, when you wrote it. Uh, less than a week later, they're now 25th, according to Cleaning the Glass, despite playing uh, the uh, like B version of the Sixers the other night. And it's, I, I think you, you get to this point in your article, but it, it's hard to pinpoint one specific thing, right? You could say the transition defense, you could say the fouling, you could say miscommunication in, in terms of switches and in terms of what, what to do on, on certain screens. You could say general laziness. You could say Mitchell Robinson not being at a hundred percent. There's a lot of different directions you could go with it. But Jack, if I were to just put it to you like this, how would you sum up the Knicks defensive issues? What would you say? I mean, like you say, there's no one single dominant factor. I would say it's sort of a melting pot of uh, uh, of various issues, some predictable, some not. I mean, I think the biggest issue is just the raw fact that you're incorporating essentially three new starters into a scheme that's very difficult to execute properly and consistently. Um And that has been sort of the main issue. And I'm not so worried about it long term for that reason. I think Tibbs has enough of a track record where he is going to get them to nail these rotations. It's sort of, it's interesting because after writing that, I was obviously, it's a big sort of talking point at the moment on Twitter. And it kind of mirrors what happened last year. So if you look at our shot distribution at the moment, our defensive shot distribution, we are allowing a ton of frees. Um, and that's the same thing that happened last year. But last year, 
opponents shot really badly on those frees. And then after 28 games, the defense sort of ticked up and we cut down the number of attempts. And at the same time, opponents started shooting better. But the defense didn't move. So we were third before and we were third after. So the regression happened in season, but because we were executing the scheme better, it didn't show. And I think the same thing is going to happen this year where initially, you know, there's a lot of errors, there's mis miscommunications. Um, but what you'll find is, and the tell will be when the defense is getting better, is that those three-point attempts will come down because the closeouts will be crisper. They'll be running guys off the line and funneling them towards uh, Mitch and Noel in the middle. And, and that, that is, in essence, is the scheme. I think it will be all right. It's just a bit, it's a bit dodgy at the moment. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's the perfect conjunction of, of again, guys adjusting to a new scheme. And I think personnel drop-offs, and maybe this, this is something everyone noted, but maybe something that they underrated, like going from Kemba Walker to, like I shiver to say it, but El or from Alfred Payton to, to Kemba Walker, which again, should in no world, in, in no context should be a drop-off, but you're losing, you're losing some size there. Um, Evan Fournier to Reggie Block. Again, you're losing a little bit of size. You're losing a little bit of physicality. Um, and I feel like Fournier and Kemba in particular, and, and this is, again, them just being new, like on top of any physical limitations, the communication side of it has been really poor. And you, you see just a couple of possessions every game where someone gets a wide open or near open three because Kemba and RJ just don't really talk. Or, or there was a play in the Cavs game where, where Kemba got switched onto a big and RJ noticed and, oh, sorry, no, this is the Bucks game. It was Bobby Portis and, and RJ kind of noticed and RJ said, all right, I'm going to tag down and, and make sure you're not caught in the post against uh, Bobby Portis and is, is leering mean eyes. Um, no, I love Bobby Portis. Um, and, and then it, it just results in a wide open three because Kemba, Kemba didn't get out to the perimeter uh, quick enough. And it, it just little, little things like that, that you just have to be very, very sharp. And, and Kemba and Evan are, again, two of the smarter players in the NBA. I don't think I don't think the intellectual side of this is ultimately going to be a problem for them. It's just physically, what is the difference between Kemba Walker closing out and Alfred Payton closing out? And what is the difference between Evan Fournier closing out and Reggie Bullock closing out? But my bigger concern is actually something you didn't touch on all that much in the article, and, and that's more so Mitchell Robinson. And I think he is someone who, in, in my preseason prognosis for the Knicks, I was saying there will be these issues Mitchell Robinson will be there to clean up a whole lot of them with his mobility and with his added size. And we've seen the added size. He's done a much better job against behemoths in, in the post, not getting bowled over. Still a fantastic shot blocker around the basket. But the, the mobility that defined his game, I, I think, is, if not entirely missing, then significantly diminished. We saw uh, Evan Mobley just absolutely torch him the other night when he, when he got caught on the wing just to rip through right by him for a dunk. We I, I can't remember Mitch blocking a three-pointer this year, which seemed to be something that occurred once or twice a game in the past. And it just... Oh, he did. He did. It was the first play of the Indiana game. Yeah. Oh, he got, yeah. 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 I remember it because it was a weird little elevator play they ran and uh, and he got the block. But I think that's the only one. Obi's yeah, no, block. Obi's block. Yeah. And so there, there you go. Um, the point being, like, he does not seem like quite the same guy. And I thought, ultimately, like, you, you talk in your article a lot about the transition defense and the overfouling. Like, the, those are areas Mitch isn't going to solve. But to your point in the article, those are issues that are solvable. If Mitchell Robinson is not the same guy, I think that is an unsolvable problem for the Knicks. And, and the question is, is, is it just a matter of time or is it the fact that, again, he, he put on all this weight? I mean, yes and no. I, I do think he's 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 getting back from an injury that is reasonable to expect him to take time to get back from. Um, but I think he's been OK. I just think that it's a very high stress role to put him in. I mean, again, this scheme is not a normal scheme. You know, it's, it's super aggressive. And what it does is it sort of puts you in rotation immediately and if all the perimeter players do their job, then essentially, eventually, someone's going to be driving towards Mitch or Noel. Now, it's a very helter-skelter scheme. It's kind of a bit of a thin line between frantic and aggressive. And that's a lot of stress to put on Mitch. He's he's going to make errors. Don't forget that he didn't have that much time in the scheme last year. And that's why I think you're seeing Noel comes back and he's like seamless. He's absolutely nailing it. And you can see his impact has been incredible. Um Hopefully he's okay after last night. I mean, I, I do think there's physical limitations for Mitch, but I think as the scheme beds in generally with that starting unit and he finds his feet, just I think he'll be all right. Maybe he won't be exactly the same guy, but you know, him and Noel playing 48 minutes, I think is gonna be is gonna be 
well, it is by design, the yeah. backbone of the scheme. And I think, I mean, maybe I'm just being overly optimistic, but I think it's going to, it's going to get better. You know, it's, it's been 11 games. It's been a funky 11 games. And where you see his errors are usually because he's hugging into the paint rather than closing out on shooters. Um, and that's kind of just a matchup thing. You mentioned Mobley. You know, Mobley's just, he's a, he's just a freak. You know, he's awesome already on both ends. Yeah, so. That's kind of my point. Mitch, is, Mitch was supposed to be that guy, right? Like, I'm not in terms of draft pedigree, but Mitch was, Mitch is like like him blocking Harden step backs as a rookie. Like, he had those freakish qualities as well. Now I'm like, has he gone down just, a, a drop on that like insane athleticism meter or, or maybe yeah is, yeah that, that's sort of my question but if you uh if you watch like those i mean the turner three that that was sort of an inflection point for the the narrative yeah. on mitch this year and i mean i don't know he, he makes a few errors but you know turner's seven feet tall and shoots with like a obs rookie year moon ball mm. mitch's like almost blocking three or four of them he's like fingers tips away so like Mm, yeah, uh, he hasn't been, you know, perfect Mitch, but I don't think he's been like awful. I think it's just like uh, as the whole starting unit, starting unit has been, it's been patchy. I think the execution and the effort has been patchy, and that's what's been a bit disappointing. Yeah, I think I think my underlying premise is like the Knicks almost, and and maybe not because obviously they didn't give Mitch the extension, so maybe that that says a lot about what they thought about him. But in my mind, the Knicks were building this team around the idea that Mitchell Robinson could be a top 10 to 12 defensive player in the NBA. And he's been he's been good defensively, but he hasn't he hasn't quite been that. But anyways, Jack, we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back and we'll continue this conversation on the Knicks defense. I love Thanksgiving, all the good food and treats and plenty of them. But maybe you want a yummy dessert that isn't so full of calories and sugar. Well, then it's the perfect time for Built Bars. Built Bar is the new holiday dessert. Feast on something delicious and feel good about it. One slice of pie has upwards of 300 calories, and that's on the low end. Most Built Bars are only 130 calories and only 4 grams of sugar with plenty of protein. Replace the coconut cream pie with coconut Built Bar, or go to Raspberry Built Bar instead of that raspberry pie. Lots of good flavors to replace any pie. <laughs> low calorie, low carb, low fat, high protein. Covered in 100% real chocolate. Built Bar is, is a great option for when you're hungry. If Thanksgiving isn't coming soon enough, just go for a Built Bar or two now. Share some at your family gatherings. It makes things less awkward. Maybe Aunt Betty hasn't tried a Built Bar quite yet. New surprises all month. Limited time flavors arriving at Built.com regularly, so check the site often. There's nothing like a Built Bar Black Friday. Mark your calendar. Black Friday will be a huge event with all sorts of surprises. So go to Built.com, use promo code LOCK15, and you'll get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, welcome back into Locked On Knicks. Once again, we wanted to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today. And every day we are unavailable on all podcast platforms, including, and you know this if you are currently watching, on YouTube. And I am joined by my favorite Englishman, Jack Huntley. Shout out, Jack. Um, let's 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 keep going. Uh, so we were talking Mitch a little bit. You mentioned Nerlens. Um, just in, in three games back now, Nerlens has made – um, again, not in terms of the team's overall ranking, but seemingly every time he's on the floor, um, a massive, massive difference. And I think a lot of it is like you can preempt a whole lot of defensive issues if you're forcing turnovers, right? Like that's that's just five or six extra possessions a game. I think Nerland's first game back, Fred Katz had the stat. He had something like 12 deflections, like in an average year, the NBA's league leader has four, um, which is uh, per game, which is just nuts. Um, and, and you can, you're just removing however many chances that a team has to to torch Kemba Walker or to beat Evan Fournier around a screen or to count on Julius Randle, as you note in your article, not moving as fast as he ideally should be moving. Um, what, what have you seen from Nerlens since his return? And how do you think that could potentially shape the Knicks defense if he continues to, I mean, I guess pending Mitchell Robinson, play more and more? I mean, I so I, I was not the, the biggest fan of Nerlens last year just because of, you know, his sort of, the paradox of his two-way hands defensively he's an absolute menace like an absolute all-time deflections guy and um, but then on obviously offensively he has his struggles i think we need him more this year you know this this team's third in offense um and hasn't even played that well on offense yet i would say you know offense is not an issue so 48 minutes of noel and mitch is going to be the thing that sort of defines how how good the defense can be and then you know in turn how good we can be as a team 
I think Nerlens is really important for that um, because he is an elite, elite rim protector. Um, and he's very destructive and he suits the scheme and he's sort of well practiced in it. The only the only thing that's the problem with him defensively, I think, is certain matchups he just can't handle. You know, if, if it was him instead of Mitch against Valentinus, he would have been absolutely torched. You know, and he struggled a little bit against Drummond just on the boards. He's he's just really small, you know, he's slender. Um, but overall I've been, yeah, delighted with how he's played. And I think he's he's more important this year than he was last year because his offensive limitations um aren't felt so much because we really just are not struggling for playmakers as we were last year. All right, let's talk uh, Julius Randle a little bit because I, I mentioned it before, but you you noted his his movement speed in your article at the time. He was he was literally in terms of um, I think total miles traveled per game. Um, he was last on the team. I, I checked it out. He is now second uh, behind Kevin Knox. Um, <laughs> and I was I, I looked at that and I was like, oh, that makes sense. That Come makes on, Kev. Yeah, um, yeah, that is that is that has been That's the defining. If you want a defining statistic of the Kevin Knox uh, story, it's just like, well, he doesn't really move that much. He kind of just, he kind of just seems a little, little tortoise esque. Um, but uh, Randall, and, and you know this in your article too, a season ago, he was also the slowest guy on the Knicks. And, and last year, he was getting all the plaudits in the world for his defensive work. There were advanced statistics that painted him as one of the, the single most impactful defenders in the NBA. I thought there was some noise there. I thought it was more about the surrounding pieces and that he was, he was merely, he was, he was good a year ago. And this year, it feels like there are moments where he's good, and he's he certainly has fantastic talent defensively. Like like you put him in an isolation against a high level scorer, like he will he will hold his own in a competitive moment. It, it's more so the the moment to moment awareness, right? It's the not complaining about a foul on one end and getting back. It's not getting back cut when you're when you're looking another direction. And I I'm of the opinion that that'll continue to get better. And I think as things continue to flow for, because clearly like a lot of this is like frustration from the offensive end translating over to defense. And last night we saw him have a spectacular night offensively. I can't say I watched him every single possession on defense. Um, and I know uh, George's knee and got him a couple of times, which is not good, but he was, he was by and large pretty solid. Um, but, but what do you, what do you see from Randall? And, and to me, I think it's, it's less so like, I mean, like obviously he has to cut out the bad plays, but you want more proactively good plays from him because you, you're sort of relying like, like the premise of this team defensively is again, the guard, Guards are probably not going to be great, at least in the starting lineup. Three, four, and five need to be really, really good. I mean, yeah, you know, Julius is, you know, he's never going to be the, you know, the best defender on a team. His role on this team is to, is to, you know, execute consistently and make the right reads and put in the effort. And he doesn't have as much of an excuse as the new guys, obviously, because he's used to the scheme. He should know you know, where he has to be. And last year, I think, thought he was okay. You know, he was, he was pretty good. He is not the most positionally instinctual defender. Um, and I think that's where he gets found out um, because he's often a beat behind the play and he has to react. And that's where you see him sort of overcommit, undercommit, uh, a bit of hesitation. He's much better when, like you say, he's just in isolation and he can use his body, use his frame, use his quickness. He's got one job, that's to stop a guy, that's fine. Um, but as a sort of symptom of the whole team, I think you're right. He is the most blatant example of how the offense affects the defense when it's going well and when it's not going well. You know, when we're humming on all cylinders offensively, I think we have a tendency to let the foot off the gas defensively and sort of get a bit complacent, let up a bit, and then, you know, leads are just disappearing like sand. Whereas last year, you just couldn't do that. And, you know, that habit, that reality helped forge the consistent execution that you needed for this defense. Um, and Randall, I think, is the biggest culprit. He also has the biggest pass because he has the biggest load on offense. But there's like a nice middle ground there. You just can't be moaning about every call. You know, when you turn the ball over, you can't just be jogging back. Um, he can take time off, but he has to do the little things. You know, the effort stuff is, is non-negotiable. Um, so, yeah, I mean... I'm not super high on him as a team defender. I think he's good individually, but as a helper, he's never been amazing. But I think he can be a lot better than he has been so far this season. And to be fair to him, the last few games, I think he's got a bit better. Yeah. All right, let's let's end this defensive conversation on a positive. I, I'm really optimistic about the bench on defense. They were they were very solid a year ago, basically returned all the same people. And I think Emmanuel quickly and Obi Toppin and, and this will 
move nicely into our Hopi Toppy conversation, but I think both of them have made pretty significant strides on that in the floor. And not that quickly was like terrible, especially by rookie standards a year ago, but he just seems more consistent in everything he does and, and, and the reads he's making and leveraging his wingspan. And, and, and you, you see, you see moments. I, I know in your article, you highlighted one where like he, he just got too sort of ahead of himself and got caught up in the backcourt was over aggressive and just got blown by. Um, I think as the season is going along, we're seeing less and less of that. Maybe another guy whose offense is fueling his defense, but we're seeing moments of real harassment. Like last night against the Sixers, he, or maybe it was against the Cavs, but he, he had this great like jump up and like deflect a pass. And it was almost like a defensive lineman batting a ball down. That's, that's American football. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, just, just some, some great proactive moments from him. Rose as well has been, I mean, a little inconsistent, like Ricky Rubio was, was, was torching him, but that was, that was, I'm going to write that off as an aberration a little bit. Um, and then, and then to your, your beloved Obi, um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the floor to you, he's, but he's, he's been, again, not who we thought he was going to be coming out of the draft on defense. Yeah, I mean, fair, I'll just touch on sort of quickly in Rose and the bench unit. I, I think they have been better defensively than the Stars, um, but I would caution that, they have been sort of um, aided. It's been inflated how much better they've been than the starters because all of the bad shooting luck has happened to the starters. There is a huge discrepancy. And I think this is why all the on-off numbers for the starters and the bench are pretty much like a mirror image of each other. The bench is much better. It's all on defense. And whilst I do think that's better execution, familiarity with the scheme, there is massive uh, a massive discrepancy in three point shooting opponent three point shooting between the bench and the starters, and I think that will even out as the season goes on, and then it'll be a bit more representative as to what the actual gap is defensively between the two. Um, I do think IQ's been good. Um, I think he's got a lot better, but yeah, I don't think it's as. I mean, I think on cleaning the glass, it's like 99th percentile difference between Derek Rose and Kemba Walker. There is a difference, but it's not that big in my opinion. Um, but yeah, Obi, Obi has, I mean, you know, he's been a breath of fresh air just generally. And, you know, it's a good segue because if we're talking about the team's offense influence and its defensive effort, that just does not happen with Obi. He plays every single possession, exactly the same disposition. He's a hundred miles an hour active all, all the way through, no matter what. And uh, yeah, it makes it really easy to root for him and extremely enjoyable because, uh, He's playing so well at the moment. All right. Well, we'll, well, let's get into it. We're going to take our second and final break. We will come back. We'll talk more Obi Toppin. We're back and better than ever. A new web interface for the start of basketball season and more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code locked on to receive your bonus. From basketball, football, baseball, postseason, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, guys, we are back on locked in, locked on. I've said locked in Knicks like three times. Last week, <laughs> I really, I gotta, I gotta get that checked out. Um, but anyways, I'm Gavin Shaw. He's Jack Huntley at by Jack Huntley on Twitter. Certainly, throw him a follow. Again, a fantastic piece on the Knicks defense that dropped on October 3rd. It is pinned on his Twitter, so go there and check it out. And soon to be coming out, a fantastic piece on Obi Toppin that I just got. I got a preview of. I got that covert drop email dead <laughs> file. Had to put in seven different passports. Had my hand scanned. Had, <laughs> My eyes scanned. It was uh, at, at a secure facility at Rikers Island. It was, there was a 15-step process, but I finally got to read it, and it was it was amazing. Um, but and Jack, I'll start here. I think um, your your enthusiasm for and maybe uh, I I only know you on the internet and on podcasts, so maybe I'm mischaracterizing you. But you, you strike me as as a fairly optimistic person, and I think you're you're and, and certainly in regards to basketball and your enthusiasm for uh, maybe life is maybe too grand, but certainly for the sport. Uh, translates in everything you write. I think it really <laughs> translates in this piece in particular because Obi is such an inherently joyful player who sort of brings like the very like base enjoyments of basketball, like Obi Toppin encapsulates all of them. And I think that really comes through in your writing. So I will I will start off here. What what delights you the most about Obi Toppin? I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, thank you, first of all. Yeah, but of course, um, yeah. I think 
it's it's just the way he is so sort of boyish he's he's very uh authentic in the how much he loves playing and i mean he's just an insane athlete the combination of his sort of um his disposition his effort levels his activity levels coupled with like the way he moves how fast he is everything he does is sort of like uh sharp and it's just extremely enjoyable to watch especially now he's getting a bit more joy um you know with his teammates finding him maybe they're becoming familiar with those cuts there's a bit more space obviously um he's just an absolute menace he's he's electric in transition he's he's always moving and uh yeah, he's played really well. He's, you know, he's 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 been about as good as he could possibly be without hitting shots. So, yeah, it's been it's been a joy to watch, definitely. Yeah. All right. So you talked a little bit about his defense, but where do you think the biggest improvements are for him offensively this year? Because for me, I'm I'm almost conflicted on if he definitively got better or if it's more so that he's finally being used in the right way and being allowed to be a rim runner, um, particularly with Emmanuel quickly. Um, obviously last year he was already on basically the same bench unit, but getting some minutes with hybrid lineups with starters where, where he constantly has good shooting around him, constantly has like, like never, not that he played a ton with Elf last year, but never has to play with Alfred Payton, right? It's always, it's always Derek Rose, Emmanuel quickly. Um, there, it, it seems like his environment has certainly gotten better, but I'd also argue like this is a guy who, again, in the jump shot hasn't shown the way it has or it did in summer league but just definitively has rounded out different portions of his game. Like the ball handling is a little bit better. He seems so much more decisive attacking close. That's last year. Literally his only move was that fake dribble handoff and he would do it even when there wasn't another player coming around for a handoff. And it was, and it, it kept working because it was so like his just <laughs> jolting movements were so shocking that it, it kind of caught defenders off guard regardless. But this year he's just, it just seems like he's that much quicker in everything he does. And he's, he's figuring out for a guy with a, somewhat limited skill set offensively how to fully leverage that athletic ability yeah i mean he's just i mean the main thing is he's an incredible finisher so yeah. um that you know was the whole book on him coming out of the draft that was the bankable skill that was you know he was a amari-esque type finisher and you know so far this season he's been incredible it's not just dunks you know he's he's making these sort of uh drive into a defender hang a little bit and then just put up a little baby jumper he's contorting himself for these obscene layups around people um and yeah it's the pressure that he puts on the rim you know even when he doesn't get the ball his cuts are you know getting defensive attention and it's constant it's, it's every possession all the time and if your iq or rose who he's had incredible chemistry with since day one you know, it's just it's just an easy play to make, and it opens up the floor for everyone else. Um, defensively, his his um, his improvements of, I mean, I think he's actually a really good team defender. We were talking about Randall earlier. I think he's a more instinctual team defender than Randall, and he's aided by the fact that his effort does not change. He's always super active. Um, but I think in one on one situations where people do target him. You know he's hit and miss but for the most part he holds his own um and especially against sort of quicker guys i think he's been good the problem comes when he goes against bigger guys which have sort of uh lower center of gravities and more mass and um, he can be moved and he could do with putting on a little bit of weight or a bit of strength in his lower body but um yeah i mean all in good time i, I mean you remember doing all those draft podcasts when we were talking about yeah. him the whole thing was, is he going to be able to even be playable defensively? You know, he's just going to get picked apart every single possession. And he's he's far exceeded that already. So happy days. Yeah, I mean, that was my concern last year was like, especially when he first started, was the offense has to be so good to offset yeah. his defense. And as the defense has gotten better, the bar on offense was like we were talking about, like, this is someone and this was sort of the expectation for him. Like he needs to walk into the NBA as a borderline 20 point scorer. And when he was so far away from that, I was like, oh, God, this is a real mistake. But then you, you, you started watching the defense. And for me, like I came in with that opinion because you heard from so many, like, again, a lot of really smart people like it's just not going to happen yeah. for him on that end. And you watch and you're like, it's not that bad. And then it, it's to your point, it's gotten to the point where he's actively a, a positive now, especially his, his rim protection. And I think you note this in the article is in the 76th percentile for his position ahead of guys like Giannis, like right nearly on par with Mitchell Robinson. Like that yeah. is like the, the flash plays defensively and, and the flash plays offensively. I mean, like his, his speed and you notice, like I, I said it yesterday, I think he's like one of the five fastest guys in the NBA maybe end to end. And it almost feels like, I mean, this is sacrilegious to invoke these names, but a little bit, 
of, of what the Miami Heat had going with Dwayne Wade and LeBron James. And then early in, in LeBron's Cleveland tenure with Kevin Love, where a guard will get a rebound. And if Obi is on the floor, you're almost just throwing it, right? You're not even yeah. really looking. You're saying he will be streaking down the court. He will be ahead of whoever's there. And even when it goes wrong, like last night, Burks threw him one. That was just a terrible pass. Obi sprinted out of bounds, somehow threw it over his head, got it back to Burks, who got it to IQ for a three. He just makes really positive things happen with, with that level of activity and energy. Yeah, 100%. His energy is insane. Um, and uh, in transition, yeah, he's because he closes out on a shot so well, which, you know, we were talking earlier, that's like a hallmark of the scheme. You absolutely have to close out on these three-point shooters. When that shot goes up, he's gone. You know, he's over half court in, you know, one as soon as whoever got the rebound obi's gone and his hands up and yeah it's uh it's beautiful to watch yeah he's he's been fantastic all right uh this is a, a bummer of a question to to possibly end on but we have to ask it every time and you, you get into a little bit in the article but his future on this team, it's sort of what we're what we're really like beating around the bush this whole conversation because he's still only playing 14 minutes a game this year and, and as you you clarify in your article got 28 minutes against the celtics there was another game where he got 23 minutes outside of that he's averaging 11 and a half minutes a night and it doesn't really matter how well he plays we were saying this before like like there could be a night where he he would score 30 points if given enough minutes but you just never know it because there's no there's there's there's, there's a cap ceiling on, on how much he can play any given game as long as Julius Randle is healthy and maybe at some point like Julius suffers like a minor nagging injury goes down for 10 games and the Knicks really get to see what they have in Obi Toppin but right now it feels like this there's like this weird clock on it where it's like this is great but this guy is probably destined for more and that's awesome because initially some of us uh raise his hand um thought he was going to be a bust and and this is obviously the, the better outcome but there's a downside of that where it's like will we get to see the the greatest version of this on the Knicks? Well, I mean, probably not. You yeah. Know, it's, your best player plays the same position. So no, <laughs> you know, it, it, they cannot coexist as the, as like actualized versions of themselves on the same team, really. I mean, small ball is a great idea and there is definitely a role for that. I think it can work. I think it can be a get us out of a big hole um, when we're down, say, 10, 15, 20 points. That can be something that you turn to. But I really, I, I, there's a whole, it's just a, it's not a problem with an easy solution. I, I completely agree with Tibbs in his insistence on 48 minutes of rim protection. Like we were saying earlier, especially this season, we've got three centers on the roster who are really good defenders, you know, Whilst they are there and whilst we are playing this scheme, which was worked, it worked last year with we the third best defense in the league, you have to have that rim protection. Offense is not a problem at the moment. So, you know, doing something just to get Obi more minutes at the expense of the general context of the team, which at the moment is offense great, defense not so great. I get it. You know, I get it. And with Randall, Maybe he could shave a few minutes of off Randall and take some of those and get up to sort of 15 a game consistently. I would like to see that happen. Um, but is Tibbs going to do that? <laughs> no. And, and his rationale for doing it is that Randall's his blessed player and he's going to play him loads of minutes. So that makes sense. You know, it's kind of just uh, we've got to enjoy what we get. Hope that over the course of the season, when everyone beds in and Tibbs is probably a little bit more comfortable experimenting, um, with lineups and tweaking roles, maybe we see a little bit more. Um, as you say, when people miss time, maybe that opens up minutes. But I just, you know, it is a problem. And eventually there's, you know, Obi's probably going to be on the way out, let's be honest. But that's down the line. And, you know, him becoming a really good player makes him like a sizable chip in any future trade. Um, and in the meantime, he's playing minutes and he's contributing to winning. So, I, you know, Tibbs is Tibbs. So it, it, is, it is what it is to a certain extent. I would like to see him play more, but I can understand why he doesn't. And, you know, we are just got to enjoy, enjoy what he does when he, when he does get on the floor at the moment. Yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's a good point. And I, I guess my, my final one would be I'm curious if there's – if there's a role in the playoffs for that small ball lineup, because we saw the I, the Clippers, I mean, really like not, I don't want to say like change the trajectory of like playoff basketball going forward because out of them and they got out in the conference finals, but it was, it's interesting what they've done the last couple of years and particularly 
Um, this past year, like we're against the Mavericks when the Mavericks went super big, they went super small. And then um, they theoretically, oh, well, they, they beat the Jazz, obviously. And then they tried to do the same thing to the Suns. And the Suns said, oh, no, we this is why we spent the number one pick on DeAndre Ayton, who we, we're not extending, but, but we value in the moment. Um, and, and DeAndre Ayton was able to sort of counteract that small ball lineup. And it was enough, at least sans Kawhi Leonard, for the Suns to win that series. And, and my big takeaway from all that was, wow, it's a good thing the Knicks have Mitchell Robinson, like this hyper switchable, like mega athlete freak center. And, and again, with Mitch, like this goes back to the earlier portion of the conversation. Who knows if he is still that guy? But I, I wonder, again, like the Knicks would not see the Clippers outside of the NBA Finals. And that feels like a, a pipe dream for both those teams at this point. But I wonder if there is a playoff matchup where Obi and Randall makes a lot of sense with another team going small, or if Tibbs sees another team go small and he says, all right, they're going to be getting to the rim a lot. I still want Mitchell Robinson, um, even even if he has to hover over to a three point shooter. I want him on the floor to try and recover. Or I want Nerlens Noel on the floor to try and recover to help at the rim. And we saw with Rudy Gobert that even with a great defender, that is easier said than done. And I wonder if having someone like Obi, who can give you some of that mobility defensively and then offensively, can act as a rim runner to counteract a small ball look on the other end of the floor. If, if there's some value there, but this is maybe this is me galaxy braining it because that is far down the road and it would take a very specific team for that to sort of come to fruition. No, I mean, I definitely agree that playoffs are all about, you know, the ability to be versatile in whatever your base schemes are, because by the end of a series, you are not going to be playing the same coverages that you play at the start. Um, so you have to have plans B, C and D to go to. Small ball is definitely an option. I mean, in order for that to become a viable or at least something that, that Thibodeau would consider, obviously, like you say, obviously with the matchups and everything, but Obi's going to have to be hitting shots. Like, if he is not hitting shots, then I don't think Tibbs is going to turn to that. So that's one thing. But I wouldn't necessarily rule out the possibility of Tibbs you know, looking further down the line and being open to it just based on the first 11 games of the season. You know, we spent 20 minutes talking about how at the moment, learning the defensive scheme and executing that properly is the priority for the Knicks. If he starts messing around with roles, you know, um, taking away rim protection and centers, it changes the scheme. And so I think it, after sort of game 40, 50, we might see a little bit more... Um, of that OB Randall look, as long as the defense has shown itself to um, be effective, sort of like it was last season. If you nail down the scheme, then we can look at something else. But until we execute that properly, it's just not something that Tibbs is going to prioritize getting reps at. Um, again, it's a good problem to have, but let's just wait and see how we're looking after sort of 50 games. Um, and then, yeah, like you say, in the playoffs, it's a completely different ball game. And, you know, what, what happens and what works and what doesn't work in the regular season, like we saw with the Hawks, it doesn't apply over the a little um, bubble cauldron that is an individual playoff series. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I think I think we were both of sort of the same mind, whether it's the playoffs, whether it's the regular season, I think Obi Toppin might be a 30 point game. It might be a giant fourth quarter. I think he he's going to have some moments for this Knicks team, but Jack Huntley, that is a good of a note as any to end on. Uh, really appreciate you joining me one final time. Can you remind everyone, even though it's right in this graphic uh, where they can find you on social media and, and all the great stuff you've done on the Strickland. I mean, maybe even going further back because I think again, all your articles absolutely worth reading. Uh, I mean, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's always good to hop on. Um, so it's at by Jack Huntley uh, on Twitter. I write for the Strickland. I mean, just to plug everything the Strickland's doing at the moment, we've uh, got a Patreon this this year. So um, check that out. There's some great content on there. We've had some awesome guests on some of the podcasts um, uh, on there with Schwinn and I know Dra Draft Strickland and Prez had a special guest on yesterday that you probably want to check out. Yeah. It's very uh, uh, topping related. Yeah, so. Yeah. Just plug in everything that they're doing over there. And um, yeah, check out my stuff. Thank you very much for listening. All good. Um, the sky isn't falling. We'll be all right. We'll be all right. You'd love to hear it. All right. Thanks so much, Jack. And that is it for this edition of the Locked On Knicks podcast. Again, if you're not already, please subscribe on YouTube. Subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. And leave us leave us a five-star review. If not for me, then, then for Jack. He really gets down when, when we don't get five-star reviews. All right. And we'll talk to you all soon.